Welcome to this video on the electrocardiogram, more commonly known as the ECG. This video is aimed at medical students. We're going to cover everything you need to know about ECG basics for medical school exams and beyond, explained in an easy to understand way. Every healthy heartbeat originates because a wave of electrical activity is spreading through the heart in a predictable way. This electrical activity can be recorded onto paper, which gives us the ECG. Any deviations from the normal pattern can be picked up and used to diagnose various pathology. The pulse of electrical activity that results in contraction of the heart originates in the sinoatrial node, which is found in the right atrium. The sinoatrial node, or SA node, sends out a wave of depolarization which spreads across the atrium and causes them to contract. This wave of depolarization will then reach the atrioventricular node, or AV node which is found at the interatrial septum. This will then release its own wave of depolarization. This will spread down the bundle of Hiss into the Purkinje fibers and across the ventricles. This causes them to contract. Following this, the myocardium will then repolarize so that it's ready for its next wave of electricity. This all makes up one heartbeat and can be seen on the ECG as one complex. All of this electrical activity can be detected using electrodes on the skin. Typically, 10 electrodes are placed, one on each limb and six on the chest. An easy mnemonic to help remember the color order of limb electrodes is ride your green bike, starting at the right arm and going clockwise. Now, it's easy to get confused between electrodes and leads, since physically speaking, each electrode has a lead or wire attached to it. When referring to ECGs, an electrode is the conductive sticker that's placed on the skin that detects electricity, whereas a lead is the graphical representation of the electrical activity coming from the heart in a specific direction. 10 electrodes will produce a 12 lead ECG, which is what you will commonly come across in practice and in medical school exams. You can think of this 12 lead ECG as a graph, with the X axis representing time. ECGs are commonly calibrated to 25 millimeters per second, so that one small square is equivalent to 0.04 seconds, and one large square is 0.2 seconds. The y-axis then represents the amplitude of electricity, with 10 millimeters being equivalent to one millivolt. The way the leads in this ECG are laid out is what you will commonly see in medical practice with limb leads on the left, which are 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL and AVF, and then chest leads on the right, which are V1 to V6. Limb and chest leads look at the electrical activity of the heart in different planes. I'll explain this more clearly in a moment. The long, uninterrupted strip at the bottom is called the rhythm strip, and is usually lead 2. Let's now have a closer look at the difference between limb and chest leads. Limb leads look at the electrical activity of the heart in the coronal plane. To better visualize the coronal plane, imagine a guillotine separating the front and back of a person. This diagram may look complicated at first glance, but don't worry, you don't need to memorize it. It's simply showing how each limb lead looks at the electrical activity of the heart from a different angle, all along the coronal plane. For example, Lead 2 is measuring electrical activity in the direction of 60 degrees in the coronal plane, which is achieved by comparing electrical activity at electrodes in the right arm and left leg. Again, you don't have to memorize the specifics of this, but just try to understand the underlying principle that each limb lead is measuring electrical activity in a different angle by using a different combination of the various electrodes placed on the skin. Chest leads are measuring electrical activity in the transverse plane. This gives us leads V1 to V6. We can also differentiate between leads based on the area of the heart that it can pick up abnormalities for. This is particularly useful when trying to determine which area of myocardium, and therefore which coronary artery, is diseased in a heart attack or myocardial infarction. 
Leads V1, 2, 3 and 4 are known as anterior leads. ST elevation in these leads will represent ischemia in the distribution of the left anterior descending coronary artery. We're going to cover this and ST elevation in more detail in the next two videos. Leads 1, AVL, V5 and V6 are lateral leads, which represent the distribution of the circumflex artery. Finally, leads 2, 3 and AVF are inferior leads, which represent distribution of the right coronary artery. Now, to understand the segments of the ECG waveform, it's important to have a basic understanding of the cardiac action potential. Cardiac myocytes rest at minus 90 millivolts, with a high concentration of sodium and calcium extracellularly, and a high concentration of potassium intracellularly. The difference in ions across the membrane means the myocyte is polarised. You can think of an action potential as a temporary reversal of the charge across the membrane, as there will be an influx of sodium from outside the cell, which depolarizes the membrane towards neutral charge. This is then followed by repolarization, which is controlled by potassium moving out of the myocytes. The myocyte will then be reset by ion transporters for another round of depolarization. It is this depolarization event that triggers contraction of the myocardium. It's also these depolarization and repolarization events that move the recording needle up or down on the ECG giving us positive or negative deflections. A wave of depolarization moving from a negative to positive electrode creates an upwards deflection on the ECG, as does a wave of repolarization moving from positive to negative. This might sound a bit confusing and takes a bit of time to get your head around, but remember, it's just the basic principles we need to understand here and not necessarily memorizing all of these directions. Similarly, a wave of depolarization moving from positive to negative will cause a downwards deflection on the ECG, as will a wave of repolarization moving from negative to positive. Where the ECG wave follows the isoelectric line, i.e. it remains flat, it either means there's no electrical activity between the two electrodes, or that the direction of electricity is perpendicular to the electrodes. Here's a table to quickly recap those directions. This is all going to make more sense as we go on to look at the components of a normal ECG complex. A single ECG complex is essentially a sum of all of the electrical activity that makes up a single heartbeat. The first deflection is the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization. It's an upward deflection in most leads because the overall direction of electricity across the atria is moving from negative electrode to positive. Following this is the QRS complex, which represents ventricular depolarization. It has both negative and positive deflections because the wave of depolarization spreads across the ventricles, traveling in multiple directions both towards and away from positive electrode. Following ventricular depolarization, we have the T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization, where potassium moves back across the myocyte membrane to repolarize the cell back to minus 90 millivolts. In addition to the P wave, QRS complex and T wave, there are also intervals and segments we need to be aware of. The PR interval is measured from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS, representing the time taken from atrial depolarization to ventricular depolarization. The ST segment is the time from the end of ventricular depolarization and beginning of repolarization. This should be flat and lie on the isoelectric line. Finally, the QT interval from the start of the QRS to the end of T wave, represents both ventricular depolarization and repolarization together. Abnormalities in any of these waves, complexes, intervals, or segments can represent pathology in the heart, but also elsewhere in the body. 
We're going to cover how to identify these abnormalities in the next video, where we're going to use a systematic and easy to follow structure that will allow you to interpret any ECG. Thanks for watching and see you next time.